report on the 2015 GEOINT Symposium that was held in Washington, D.C. was recently released, and I'd like to bring you some of the highlights of that final report. But before that, I'd like to point out something that um, I just recently found out. GEOINT, or the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation, is a not-for-profit 501c3 corporation. So, just to make this very clear in everybody's heads, they are incorporating Department of Defense, military, governments, NGOs, tech companies that we all pay taxes to run. Our taxes go to the government, the military, Department of Defense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These organizations are now combining under GEOINT that is a tax-exempt organization. I don't know, I just don't know how that works, but that's a fact. So going back to the GEOINT Symposium, final report. Government participation ranged widely from uniformed military personnel and U.S. intelligence community employees to U.S. federal civil agency practitioners. And going down, we have spent more than a year developing a GEOINT essential body of knowledge with practitioner contributions from defense, law enforcement, and U.S. intelligence agencies, as well as from the first responder, agriculture, oil and gas, mining, and mineral extraction, and broader business communities. Now, so this initiative has now gone beyond previous initiatives that I've reported on in that it's extended from government and military to the energy, corporate, and food production sectors. Moving on. As a result of confluence of technologies, the rise of ubiquitous computing power, global networks, and geospatial science and technologies that are available to a wide range of practi practitioners than ever before. Boy, this is poorly written. There is a new model for the geospatial practitioner. New tools and data sources pop up seemingly overnight. For example, the number of geospatially aware apps on our smartphones is growing at an exponential rate. Nearly every new app leverages underlying infrastructure, maps, and analytic tools needed within the ecosystem. Requires, I think it should be required by geoint professionals. <clears throat> Increasingly, we have also geolocated social media and GPS enabled information. So, so then in addition to the massive data collection, they're now, they're now acknowledging that we are voluntarily giving them more information to populate the databases that will drive this system. <clears throat> the uh, professional practice of GEOINT includes the synthesis and analysis required to make sense of all data, including increasing quantities of open source data available via a wide range of social media outlets. To understand, use, and explain analyses of disparate data and information to resolve complex challenges requires both depth and breadth on both skills and domain knowledge. But Bringing all these disciplines together is at the heart of GEOINT. GEOINT is synthesis. It certainly is. It's artificial intelligence. It grows as technology advances. Uh, there are obvious GEOINT trends that are noticeably absent from this volume, including the rise of small satellites and unmanned aerial systems as sensor platforms and how analytically we will handle the current crush of ava available data. In a way, we have come full circle. GEOINT was born when government collection systems were more prevalent than commercial collection systems. <clears throat> now, both platforms and sensors 
have become commodities and we frequently struggle to make sense of all the available data. Now, this addresses another aspect of this beast tech that relates to cube satellites for human exploration and operations. These are extremely small, low orbiting satellites. Uh, the other entity that is involved in this endeavor is SpaceX and Elon Musk's agenda to launch microsatellites to create a space web of data collectors and transmitters. In November of 2014, he launched 66 of these microsatellites in that month alone. <coughs> And here's another thing that I highlighted, and I'm going to tell you why. Become a mentor to prom promising young geointers. Volunteer as STEM events in your area. Keep an eye out for this. Um, in your local newspapers, in your local tech magazines, if they're conducting a STEM seminar or a STEM meeting, go. Go to it find out what they're talking about, make notes, and make it public. Moving on. Throughout history, timely insight into what one's adversaries may be planning or doing has been considered intelligence and integral to survival. Since the success or failure of an adversary's plans depends upon going undiscovered for a period of time, Barriers are erected to keep enemies or other untrusted parties at a distance. Apologize for this document I keep disappearing here, but it's the format I downloaded it in. Uh, it is estimated roughly one hour of video footage, uh, much of it geotagged, is uploaded every second. During that same second, 46,000 Google searches are launched, and they are tracking all of this. Um, in a previous report I did, I outlined how they will geolocate every piece of information to a place or to a human network node on the planet. This is how they will formulate the boundaries and interrelationships of every human net human node on the edge network. Going on, as worldwide information flow became real time and ubiquitous print media including monthly news, magazines and, and daily newspapers suffered significant readership and advertising losses. And that's not the only reason they suffered losses, but moving on here. Fully integrating the real-time flow of publicly available and searchable information into the intelligence community's analytical realm ultimately means changing the overall system architecture to perform integrated tasking, ingest, processing, correlation, enrichment, change detection, alerting, and analytics of both classified and unclassified sources. Now, this goes to the mapping of the human domain. But moving in this direction will require a significant mindset shift that recognizes openly available information as holding value equal to tr traditional classified sources. <clears throat> this goes to the data neutrality aspect of the geo in artificial intelligence case-based reasoning module. And I discussed this as well as sequence neutrality extensively in my report with John B. Wells on Caravan to Midnight, episode 309. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency has a history and tradition of incorporating openly available, unclassified, and commodity data into its product lines. For decades, it has entered into government to government and government to commercial agreements for unclassified geospatial data sets, including commodity purchases of location 
data, the NGA led the integration of commercial imagery. Government to, to corporate collaboration goes to fascism in a global totalitarian state. The NGA is uniquely positioned to lead the intelligence community to seamless integration of open sources for additional reasons. More and more, the billions of images and millions of videos being uploaded to the web are geo-referenced, and a growing number of smartphones and other handheld devices now provide location information. Then there is the NGA's role as the glue that puts other INTs or in intelligences <clears throat> into perspective. It is often said that GEOIN is the foundation that provides context for all other intelligence sources. Now this goes to the contextual data set um, that I've referenced in other reports regarding the ABI's aspect of the human domain breakdown. Director Clapper of the National Intelligence Agency noted everything and everyone must be somewhere. This context building role made the NGA the champion for multi-in efforts across the IC or intelligence community and is still the reason the NGA plays a central role in persistent surveillance, activity-based intelligence, and the intelligence community information technology enterprise transformation. Global data collection is not being curtailed, people. It's being accelerated on every level. The context building role that they are talking about goes to the HTA tools being used to transform human beings into nodes on this global information grid. As far as this network centric artificial intelligence system is concerned, you will be reduced to the sum total of the data collected on you. And that is the end game in the quest to control more than 7 billion people on the planet, mastering the human domain. Outside the con um, confines and restrictions of heavily guarded SCIFs, and these are sensitive compartmental, compartmented information slash intelligence facilities, right here, the world's real-time information flow has eclipsed anyone's imagination. As intelligence professionals, we must seek knowledge from any source and provide our customers, their customers being military, intelligence agencies, and global governments, uh, must acknowledge from any source to provide our customers with insightful analysis that incorporates a heavily, a healthy awareness of our adversar adversaries denial and deception capabilities in the open source and multi in environments. <clears throat> To be truly effective, multi-in persistent surveillance and ABI must rely on the real-time flow of all sources of information, including that which is openly available. These driving initiatives and convergence of the heretofore stovepiped IT architecture into the ICITE provide the needed push to change our culture and system architecture. Now is the time to fully integrate openly available sources and enable the IC workforce to access the real world. So if it's not clear already, it should be clear now. They're collecting everything. Their customers, as I mentioned before, are the proponents of global government. Their adversaries appear to be the unbridled masses of humanity. Get this. Talk about putting it in your face. Spatial content mine from social media has been an information treasure trove for marketers and observers of social unrest in Northern Africa, the Middle East, and Hong Kong. Geospatial crowdsourcing is the most recent innovation where statistical techniques are used to validate the crowd. Or on another level, this could also be considered gang stalking. 
from the perspective of intelligence and law enforcement agencies and corporations which use organized gang stalking as a secret and illegal weapon for subversion, uh, the perfect operation in this context is one in which the target becomes progressively isolated, impoverished, emotionally degraded, and eventually seeks what appears to be the only available outlet, suicide. Now, I'm going to get into a couple of patents that I've been reading through that takes this whole concept to another level that, you know, is just, wow, blows the mind. But they go on to say, if collection labor is volunteered, why not collect many times? Compare the results and statistically select the most frequent answers. Certainly, with a large enough sample size, over every point on the earth, you could expect great data quality. But we're not there yet. Oh, maybe not yet, but they're close. And they're admitting to you that, you know, they are scooping up all of this personal information that we're all voluntarily putting out there on social platforms and <clears throat> other blogosphere uh, types of sites and, and whatnot. No discussion of the value of social media and crowdsourced data would be complete without acknowledging the risk of geospoofing. Could the crowd intentionally provide bad content in volumes significant enough to be credible? <clears throat> Could a bad actor promulgate bad uh, location through Twitter in significant enough numbers to cause analysts to be misled? It would be naive to dismiss this risk. The current risk is not sufficient to avoid using social media and crowdsourced data but continued vigilant is strongly encouraged. Now, here's a chink in their armor. Geospoofing is difficult for the average person to be able to do on their own, but if enough free open source developers could create an app for this that could be downloaded to a mobile or a fixed device, then we may be able to mislead their analyses and spoof the data uh, being used in the HTA tool, especially regarding ABI. Now, this next section goes to outline uh, how the U.S. government could launch such a pilot program. And I want you to keep in mind that this is how the U.S. government will be launching J2, and it's right in the final papers of this symposium that just ended on the 25th. Identify a small to mid-sized country where there's enough interest or committed geo resources to warrant a pilot program. Afghanistan, Iraq, or Iran might be good choices. Well, the Southwest U.S. is where Jade Helm, the Jade Helm exercise uh, is going to be conducted, and that area certainly fits this bill. Complete a country level vector and imagery database with the most accurate and current data available. The decisions here should not be onerous as omissions can be recovered in the maintenance process. There are sufficient standards and uh, GIS technology in place to get started. Okay, now this is absolutely true of the US, probably even more so than the Middle Eastern countries mentioned above. Dedicate a team of maintainers with 20 to 30 initially, dropping down to 5 or 10 in a year. Include developers on a team and adopt agile methods to rapidly update processes. Also include a social media mining expert. Organize in an operations center, operations center environment. The team needs to be fixated on maintaining the most current and comprehensive operational picture possible. In my analysis, this is why Colorado was opted out of participation in the Jade Helm 15 exercises. I know a lot of people are reporting that the state opted out. However, I found a press release, I believe on the army.mil website 
um, that it was the military that opted out, stating that they did not have the manpower to allocate to this operation. Moving on. Set a requirement that changes will be incorporated into the database 24 hours after a new source is received. At a minimum, include every image, every mission-specific database, every modernized integrated database update, and every OSM update. Use change detection techniques to target areas for tasking in the broadest sense, including new imagery, perhaps targeted crowdsourcing through a commercial provider or social media mining. Develop internal community sourcing that develop internal community sourcing, period. The DOD and IC have a wealth of local knowledge. Enlist a crowdsourcing entity to help develop our crowd into our community. This is a mass PSYOP. Okay. It's time for the terrestrial geospatial community to take some wind from the Mariner's sails and see if the accelerating availability of sources can be incorporated into a continuously maintained spatial database. It's important to start the experiment right in time for Jade Helm. This experiment, by the way, has been underway at the very least since the massive collection of all data on everyone has been going on for decades. Now the ICITE seeks to provide improved integration, information sharing, and security through the use of a cloud-based architecture. Okay, so we know this system will be predicated on a cloud-based architecture. What this basically means is that they will not be putting all their eggs in one basket. They will be storing our data over a distributed network. The clouds and crowds in our future. Water supplies in one region can affect hunger in entire countries and security across an entire continent. Interconnectivity is not just a digital or technological concept. The people of this planet are in the people of this planet are more interconnected than they ever have been with <clears throat> global sourcing of almost every commodity. People will become motivated by the widespread influence of seemingly local issues played out on the other side of the world. Hmm. It will be these transcendent issues that unite us, our education that guides us, like Common Core, and the evolution of the technology that fuels us, like a global AI system. Now, I'd like to stop here and comment that I see this going to global command and control of resources on the planet. Look at California. They're projected to run out of water in eight months. They saw this coming for the past three years and still haven't come up with a solution. Look at Lazard, who, a corporation who attended the uh, Bilderberg meeting earlier this month. They have a new concept called New Levelized Costs of Energy Analysis, which I'm going to be releasing our report on very shortly here. This points to globalized energy and resource management using smart grids and these smart meters that are plugged into them to cut off or choke off or ration energy at any given time for any given reason. Now, here's one of the biggest, this next statement here is one of the biggest propaganda statements on this technology I have ever heard to date yet. Here we go, quote, this ever evolving uh, compute power eases many concerns about big data. It is often forgotten that storage, compute, and transfer abilities have all kept pace with the size of data at any given point in time and are likely to do so in the future. 
The ability exists to store vast quantities of data, process them in an efficient manner, recall them when necessary, and move them quickly from place to place. With decreasing costs and increasing simplicity, capacity, and performance, small communities of citizen analysts can form into crowds and in aggregate amass technical capabilities on par with large-scale organizations. Furthermore, crowds are only bound by law and their own morality. Such crowds can be more agile, respond to change, and even grow, form, or split or disband as needed. What? Really? This statement flies in the face of the TPP and of net neutrality. They are going to put this technology in the hands of humanity to solve our own problems. If you have any doubt, do some research on a guy named John Hutchinson. He was conducting experiments in his home uh, with Tesla technology, free energy and directed energy. The feds raided his home, confiscated his equipment and research, and locked him up. So now we're to believe that they're going to just give us all this wonderful technology on the same level they have and are using it for us to solve our own immediate, either individual, regional, or national problems. Give me a break. How stupid do they think we are? The priority has traditionally been on content, mostly in the form of data and the analytic judgments brought to bear on intelligence issues or military operations. It is no longer the case, however, that content reigns supreme. Well, of course not. They're going to be using artificial intelligence. In this sense, content is about judgment, insight, and human cognition. Now, this next section here goes to the AI and predictive capabilities of future events by a network-centric system that operates on a global information grid. Quote, why visual thinking? Throughout history, the spatial and visual components of strategic planning, including spatial awareness, visual thinking, imagination, and the spatial visual dimensions of the subconscious mind, have been the cornerstone of political and military success, prim primarily because they are the foundation for decision making, organizing, and coordinating behavior and imagining alternative courses of action. <clears throat> Visualization is much more than a byproduct of optical nerve activity. It is the synchronon of imagination, foresight, creative thought, pattern matching, intuition, diagnostics, simulation, analyses, and the cognitive process central to the intelligence analytics and, and the emergence of wisdom from corporate knowledge management activities. Cognitively, the visual pathway associ associated with the cerebral and visual cortices is the seat of mental prowess, the brain's high bandwidth process for integrating all sources of sensory information, memory, and imagination. Again, I'm going to be releasing a report on some very important patents um, that I've been researching in line with this whole neural net. Moving on. Since the days of plotomy, moreover, the sy synergistic effects of spatial awareness and visual thinking have formed the core of the mind's eye for correlating uh, disparate pieces of information to simulate present and future realities. It is this combination that gives rise to the predictive analysis, the ability to anticipate behavior and make proactive decisions. Problem solving, creativity, and thinking through different courses of action arise from cognitive subsystems, cognitive subsystems that tap into spatial reasoning and the mental mapping facilitated through the visual cortex. This is a, oh man, this has got to be a typo, constitutive, blah, 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 multispectral and all source process, which results in a layered visualization capability that can fold space and time in any direction to facilitate reasoning. Really? Uh, 
This is quantum mechanics, quantum physics, quantum computing. Now, folding space and time, isn't this what CERN has been playing with? This is why I believe that they will be using quantum computing. This is why I believe that they're not going to be running GeoIn on conventional hardware. As um, I discussed with my, in my report with John B. in episode 309 of Caravan to Midnight, the massive amounts of data to be run against millions of algorithms producing billions of potential scenarios which will have to uh, run through yet more algorithms to yield a reduced set of scenarios and on and on and on is incomprehensible with the computing technology available to the masses today. Today we have the luxury of being ensconced in data. Data is everywhere and it engulfs us. It's geotagged so it can be mapped and the visu visualization possibilities are prolific. Yet within this data ubiquity, how can and should social responsibility be considered? This was alluded to and get this, this is very, very important, okay people? The Dallas County uh, prosecutor considered pressing criminal charges against the now deceased Thomas Eric Duncan in consideration of whether he intentionally and knowingly exposed the public to the Ebola virus. The question we might ask is whether geodata could be, could be used to prevent the spread of contagious diseases by identifying key signs in in infected individuals and forcing containment. He goes on to say, technically it could. Take Fitbit, um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a wearable device that uh, monitors your heart rate, your calories, things like that. These wearable devices track daily activity, calories burned, sleep patterns, and wait, then upload the information wirely so progress can be tracked on mobile and online dashboards. Already seen in bracelet form, it is feasible such tracking could be embedded in watches and get this, wedding rings. The opportunity is there to give away or even sell an individual's spatial health information. Whatever happened to HIPAA? A conceptually notable undertaking might be for authorities to use this information to prevent the spread of disease, yet human repercussions of such implementation could be massive. Yeah, you think? Okay, now, while there will be great advantages to broadening geolocation services, there will be undoubtedly be those who do not want to be part of human-centric geoint. When everyone is connected, conspicuous holes in the data may draw more attention than the elements that fit in. Now, what they're saying here is the holes they're referring to are those human network nodes lacking information that should be there but isn't. Now, this next section I'm going to read to you goes to the would-be developers of apps for geo-spoofing. Quote, the next intelligence arms race may be development of tools to create a credible geo-spoof record for consumption by the various engines that track a digital life. We're all going to be, become digital life forms. Okay, the deceptive information provided by the geospoofer needs to be sophisticated enough to respond to his or her purported environment. For instance, a track that is supposed to be of a person in a car needs to show response to traffic accidents, slowdowns, uh, events that both the spoofer and law enforcement might not know about in real time. To counter geospoofing, law enforcement will need to identify recurring sameness in space patterns as a potential replay or loop of previous normal day tracks. Now, that's about all I wanted to cover in this 32 page State of the GeoInt final paper that was recently released. 
Um, I would like to comment that a common theme running throughout this paper was one, winning the hearts and minds of the public uh, for support of this program. Two, encouraging and promoting the use of more open source platforms. Next, promoting public acceptance of this technology, and this is key for them. They know there's going to be pushback, and they're preparing for it. Next, how to address the question of how far will people go to trade privacy for security, and for how long will they tolerate it? Um, and the final is, um, nope, sorry, it's not the final one. Next is promoting the concept that massive data collection is in line with the understanding of a free society. Hmm. And next is who in government should make these decisions and who should be assigned what roles. Now, if you think this information has been useful, informative, or helpful in any way, please share it. Share it on social media, repost it on your own website. I don't care. Just get the information out there. And if you have any doubt that they are moving full speed forward with this program, go back and read my other reports on GeoInt. J2 is an AI software program. Go back and listen to the report done with John B. Wells, episode 309 on Caravan to Midnight. They are going full forward with this. Thank you for watching.